e te whānau o te hui nei, whae te mātou ranga ki a marama, ki a whae taki ngā mahi katoa, tu mai atu kaha, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i o tātou katoa. To the families that have gathered here this evening, seek knowledge and understanding, seek purpose in all that you do. Stand tall, stand strong, and respect one another. E te atu a matua, ino e atu ana matou, mō tō manaki tanga i tīnei rā. Arahi nā matou kurero ki a whae maramatanga mō tō orango ngā whānau i katoa, ko ihu karaiti hoki tō tātou āriki, āmene. To the Creator above, please bless us all that are at this meeting this evening. Please guide our conversation for the betterment of all families of Christchurch. A katoa hau ki ronga ki te mihi atu ki a koutou. O te whanui o o tautahi, nau mai haramai ki tēnei huihuinga i te whitiwhiti kōrero, te kaupapa o ruau moko. To you, the families of Christchurch, welcome to this evening to come along and have a listen and have a talk around the recovery of Christchurch from the earthquake. Nō reira, ki a koutou katoa, ka kaui a hui, te whakaaro me te aroha o te whanui o nai tau. Nō reira, te nā koutou, te nā koutou a te naratata katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora, Sir Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, kia ora, good evening, and welcome to Sarah's Earthquake Recovery Forum. Whether you're with us here in Burnside at the Aurora Centre or watching online, it's great to have you aboard tonight. My name is Mike Yardley, and it's my role to essentially navigate our way through tonight's proceedings. I mentioned on Facebook earlier today that I was going to be involved in this event and I soon received some very fast and rather fevered feedback uh, from critics and cynics and fed up residents who reckon this is just another talk shop, just another hooey, just another orchestrated exercise in hot air and flannel. Well, over the next three hours, you can be the judge of that. But I can assure you that this forum has been organised with the very best of intentions to inform and empower to take stock as to where we are on what can be a wandering road to recovery, to uh, shine a light on the vexing issues and challenges still facing so many Cantabs, and to outline options and solutions for you. So to deal to the key issues and concerns, tonight is going to be quite a structured affair. It's been designed so that in addition to being armed with the latest information, you will also get the opportunity to get your questions addressed on specific issues and also general issues. We are going to start with some introductory remarks from Minister Brownlee and Mayor Dalzell. Insurance, housing and land supply and outstanding zoning issues will be focus topics tonight. Uh, we will be inviting questions throughout the night and there will be a big open floor session to complete the evening. Sarah intends holding more of these forums, so you are very welcome to give Sarah your feedback with the forms that um, you will have been armed with tonight. Just a very quick health and safety message. If for any reason we need to evacuate this venue, please follow any instructions we give, and of course follow the exit signs closest to you. Now you may have noticed we have a rather impressive fleet of public and private sector leaders on hand to assist with any questions you may raise. And uh, I invite each person to stand as I refer to them by name, just to make yourselves known. Uh, from IAG, Chief Executive Jackie Johnson, Chief Executive of Naitahu, Arihia Bennett, Kai Fakahari from Naitahu, Sir Mark Solomon, the Mayor of the Waimakariri District, David Ayres, uh, Councillor from the Selwyn District, Malcolm Lyle. From MBIE Director of Canterbury Rebuild and Recovery, David Kelly. Chief Executive from the Earthquake Commission, Ian Simpson. Chair of ECAN, Dame Margaret Baisley. Acting Chief Executive of the City Council, Jane Parfitt. Redevelopment Manager for Earthquake Recovery from Housing New Zealand, Paul Commons. Uh, EQC Chair, Sir Martin Weavers. From uh, Sarah Benicia Smith. Chief Executive of the CDHB, Mr Health, David Mates. <laughs> Chief Executive from Southern Response, Peter Rose. Chief Executive from Sarah, Roger Sutton. 
Director of the Christchurch Central Recovery Unit, Warwick Isaacs. Chief Executive of Vero, Gary Dransfield. Chief Executive of the Insurance Council, Tim Grafton. And on that note, it's my pleasure to hand over to the Earthquake Recovery Minister. Please welcome Jerry Brownlee. Thank you, uh, Mike. Can I please uh, acknowledge uh, firstly Ka Whakahari for Ngai Tahu, uh, Sir Mark Solomon, uh, and the Mayor of Christchurch, and then all of you collectively, if I may. Uh, it's worth noting, I think, that all of these people who are here tonight have literally uh, hundreds of people, if not thousands, working behind them on earthquake issues. And while uh, Mike may well have received his um, email or Facebook or whatever it is, I'm not quite sure how all that works, um, uh, saying that this was just another talk fest, the reality is it's only uh, the first that we've had uh, since the beginning because we've been trying to move through so many different issues. But I did think with the election of a new council, uh, with the, um, I suppose you'd say, change in emphasis that comes with that, it was worth having uh, a get together like this uh, to answer questions. Uh, I do know what you are sending into us in a problem sense, uh, and they are often uh, symptomatic of wider problems that we're trying to sort out as we progress. What I would like to do this evening is to uh, firstly run through uh, one or two things that I think it's worth thinking about as we go through all of this. I've got some prepared notes here that I didn't actually prepare myself, so I'll leave those aside and go straight to uh, this um, relatively short and pithy presentation. And the idea of this is simply take this thing, that um, uh, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of what we're actually dealing with. It's not a simple uh, exercise. It is difficult for so many in their individual lives, but as a collective uh, challenge, it's extremely big. So we'll just see how we go here. Right. All right, so the top of that slide should have said that it's now 956 days today since the February 2nd, uh, 22nd earthquake. And in that time, if you think about what you get done in a day, 7,417 red zone properties made eligible for the Crown offer, but more importantly, 180,000 properties across the flatland in the city, given an indication of the type of land that they were dealing with. Over 1.4 billion spent on the purchase in that area. Uh, and then of course the skirt program, which we see so much of around the city, so far as of today, $866 million uh, spent on that so far. And I see Duncan Gibb in the audience, uh, who's leading that particular uh, effort on behalf of the five contractors involved. 1,494 demolitions in the city, uh, and then EQC dealing with uh, 468,079 earthquake claims. Those are claims that are truncated down uh, through, many, uh, through many processes to try and get away from the original amount of claims, which were, was over 700,000 claims. So the video you're seeing behind you is simply to indicate that everything we do takes a fair bit of time. Huge efforts go in, and just a small, small side issue, around about 90% of the, oh, okay, that didn't work, sorry. So that was 30 seconds of talk that I've just wasted. My apologies for that. Right, okay, there appears to be a skip there. So what we were told after the February 22nd earthquake was expect that the population of Christchurch would fall dramatically. Expect that the economy here would uh, fall apart, that 40,000 or more people were likely to be uh, unemployed, and that property values would go through the floor very, very rapidly. We looked at other disasters around the world, Hurricane Katrina and La Aquila in Italy are just two of them, uh, and by and large we've beaten the curve on all of those things. Not because... Uh, not the least of because the uh, reason is because people have put their heads down and got stuck in. So those cities that had disasters a lot uh, further back than us are uh, still suffering and still struggling quite a bit. What we recognised was that holding a population, holding an economy were two things that were important in recovery as well as dealing with all the individual personal issues people face. So we set up the... Uh, oh no, OK, here we go. The um, recovery process, the framework, if you like, 
Uh, and at the centre of that was the uh, capacity to make decisions. Not everyone will agree with them, but the worst thing that can happen in a disaster or recovery from a disaster is to have uh, decisions that are not clear. And one of the difficulties I'll speak of shortly is the fact that so many of our decisions have been uh, questioned that have set us back on some of the big things that we have to deal with. But you can see the attempt certainly has been, and I think largely has worked, to engage with a number of others in that process. It's led to uh, the recovery platform being put in place, a strategy being put in place, flatland zone uh, completed, red zone offers concluding, uh, demolition concluding, numerous subdivisions reopening. You go through all of that list, and they're all things that take time, take bodies of people uh, to get them together, to make them happen, and you get down to the bottom where uh, the work that David Mates has done over the past three years has led to uh, commitment to New Zealand's biggest ever hospital build here in, in Canterbury. The new Justice and Emergency Services precinct will start in February, and we have very strong economic growth with that decay curve on the seismic uh, uh, indicators following the pattern uh, that GNS told us it would, and I'm delighted that Dr Kelvin Berryman is here this evening also. So looking at what has happened uh, to our economy, firstly, uh, we're beating the curve for the rest of New Zealand by quite a long shot. So where other disaster zones around the world have fallen apart, people's commitment here has meant that we are way ahead of it, with economic growth tracking up to 7% here in Canterbury, uh, against the much lower percentage for the rest of the country. Um, we've got uh, gross domestic product. Uh, that's once again, it's, uh, it's an indicator of activity here in Canterbury, and you see that green line at the top putting us uh, way up, uh, up, up in front of it. In fact, I got those two wrong. The other one was, uh, sorry if I go back, sorry. The other one's employment, uh, where you'll see that compared to the rest of New Zealand, uh, we have very high employment here at the moment against the prediction. So then we, uh, you've heard me talk about the economy uh, ticking along really well, but the most important thing is that our population has stayed stable uh, and looks to be uh, growing, particularly from the information gleaned from the last census. We still have big challenges in front of us. We are dealing with a disaster that is on the world scale. So if you look at uh, Hurricane Katrina, it was uh, $125 billion, the biggest and uh, most expensive disaster that the world's seen in economic loss terms, but 1.2% of US GDP. Australian, uh, Australia regularly has its floods and has its bushfires. The floods uh, cost them $3 billion, a fraction of just a percent of their GDP, and what we have is 40 billion or 20 percent of our GDP. So a very, very big event. We still have uh, those issues that we have to sort out, insurance settlements, remaining zoning, and bringing more residential land to market, and the infrastructure repairs. But the picture is not, in my opinion, all that bleak. If I just come now to the skirt rebuild uh, of our infrastructure, if you look at those two photos there, the one on, the, on your left, uh, shows the damage that uh, was typical of a lot of our roads. The one on the right shows that road now repaired and frankly made a little bit better than it was before and why wouldn't we take the opportunity to do that? So far, that structure, which is a high trust model, it's New Zealand's five biggest uh, civil contractors working in alliance with a client governance board over the top of them uh, so to making sure that the, uh, the money that's being spent, a uh, large amount of money, are being spent on this exercise is spent wisely. So far they've completed 42 kilometres of freshwater pipe. That means 42 kilometres of holes in the ground uh, dug up to, to lay that pipe, 200 kilometres of wastewater and 12 kilometres of stormwater pipe, as well as many, many square metres of uh, tarmac that's been laid as well. When you look at that programme across the city, uh, they're working in all sorts of areas. Uh, pretty in a, in, a, in a fairly organised way so that while it is disruptive, it's not as disruptive as it possibly could be. Uh, the intention is to have everything east of Fitzgerald Avenue completed, uh, Duncan, not if I'm right, by the end of 2015, uh, which would be uh, see us coming to the west with the smaller amount of work uh, completed very shortly after that. If you, this is from a, a website that's available to help people navigate around the city. If you bore down into each of those little areas though, you'll find that there are multiple sites inside those areas as well. And if you go to another click on there, it'll give you information about how long roads will be closed and uh, perhaps give some indication of 
other ways to travel to various destinations. We have um, key anchor projects now decided uh, between the City Council and, uh, the, and CERA. Um, obviously, the, the, nothing is ever fixed in time, so we have a lot of discussion uh, to go on. But essentially, the plan is for the Avon River precinct, the North Frame and the East Frame, uh, to uh, be largely completed by 2017, but major work's already started. If you look along the uh, Antigua boat shed stretch of the river, you'll get a small flavour of what's possible. As we move further into the city, many of the commercial developers, uh, like Anthony Goff, who's here this evening, are engaging with Sarah and how the integration of the river precinct and their development might occur. Uh, we have the convention centre planned to start next year. Uh, with the completion in early 2017. A bus interchange, you might think that's not such a big deal, but transport is important. Uh, and uh, the bus interchange starting next year should be finished. It'll be finished ahead of that 2017. We need it for the Justice Centre, Justice Precinct. The Metro Sports Facility, uh, I don't know what you know of that, but the plan is that it's a, an Olympic-sized pool, it's a diving pool, it's got eight indoor netball courts, plus a big movement centre. Uh, and then there'll be various other opportunities for ancillary activities around sport on that side as well, completed by 2017. Uh, the health precinct is an interesting concept, taking that big $600 million rebuild around the hospital uh, and getting uh, various uh, organisations or businesses or whatever uh, that have some sort of a connection in the health sector into that precinct. Master planning for that's happening at the moment and there is uh, terrific amount of interest in it. And as I said before, the Justice and Emergency uh, Centre will be completed uh, by 2017 as well with uh, the diggers on that site either later this year or early 2014. One other issue that's been cons uh, a little bit contentious has been the uh, issue of consenting uh, and the disappointment that the Christchurch City Council lost its accreditation. It's not the end of the world, but it was a signal that things needed to change a little bit. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that the, the Mayor and the uh, Acting Chief Executive would report that uh, changes are occurring uh, for, the, for the better and are very much appreciated uh, by all. But uh, once again, you've got to put it in perspective, the residential value of consents so far during 2013 has been $1.25 billion, a huge amount of money. And in the commercial sector, where people are saying that's going faster, only $600 million. So. Uh, we're just sort of at that early start in what I think will be a very, very big ramp up. I'm going to finish here and ask the Mayor to make a few comments. We will be talking about housing, uh, about insurance and about land use uh, as, as uh, the evening progresses. And we do want to make sure that there's lots of opportunity uh, toward the end of the evening, but with plenty of time for you to ask your questions. There are a lot of people here who can give you answers. Uh, or at least give you an indication of how the thinking is going on the issues that you want to raise. Thank you. E na mana, e na reo, e na iwi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratatou katoa. Minister Sir Mark, uh, distinguished guests, uh, former parliamentary colleagues, I've seen Ruth Dyson and uh, Nikki Wagner. I don't know if there are others in the room. Um, but I, I did want to acknowledge you um, as being here today and everyone. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the Minister for Canterbury Earthquake Recovery for graciously allowing me to co-host this event. I had been planning a recovery seminar for um, the occasion that I might be successful in being elected as Mayor. Uh, the Minister at Transpired was, um, organi was organising one too. So although this agenda had a slightly different emphasis than the one that I was organising, putting that aside and accepting the invitation to co-host, I believe, has sent a very powerful message of unity, central and local government working together, something we haven't seen in this city for a very, very long time. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge my fellow councillors Deputy Mayor Vicky Buck, Jimmy Chen, Raf Manji, Jamie Goff, Ali Jones, Pauline Cotter, Yanni Johansson, Paul Lonsdale, Tim Scandrip, Phil Clearwater, and Andrew Turner. Although four of our councillors were members of the last council, we are very much a new council. Now, I'm not sure if I know how to do this. No? 
going the wrong way. Back on the right. No, they've left the photo out. Right. So, um, <laughs> at the seminar that we held on Saturday, we were joined, joined by Laurie Johnson, an urban planner specialising in disaster recovery from the United States, who is here working with the council and Sarah. And perhaps, Laurie, could you stand up and just um, smile at the crowd? <laughs> um, we're all very familiar with the expression that uh, response is the sprint and recovery is the marathon. And I've often spoken about the difference between the two and how one requires adrenaline for the sprint, the other um, requires stamina. And the preparation for a sprint is obviously quite different than the preparation for a marathon. But Laurie had another take on the metaphor, which I really liked. She suggested that it was more like a relay marathon, which combines elements of both and we've just been handed the baton by the former Christchurch City Council, and we are now running that race. She also made the point that when disaster strikes, no one is really ever prepared for the marathon. So the last council was running for election without knowing that they were going to be entering a marathon relay at the point that they were elected to office. One thing we know for certain is that every member of this new council knew exactly what they were in for. And not surprisingly, even though we all came from different political perspectives, the core values that each of was standing for turned out to be exactly the same. Transparency, accountability, unity, financial responsibility, and meaningful community engagement. It actually wasn't hard for us to agree upon our values and goals as a council. We did that very quickly. But finding that one-liner that summed it all up, ironically, that happened when I turned on my computer for the first time and the message came up on the screen. One team making it happen with integrity and passion. Part of our task is how to operationalise our collective values that we ran on as a council with the reality of our local government responsibilities, as well as the demands of the city's recovery, which are enormous, as we've heard from the Minister. In talking with experts around the world, what has really resonated with me, and you've heard me say this on the campaign trail, and others have heard me saying it for a long time, is the idea that Christchurch could be the model of resilience. I didn't fully appreciate the true meaning of the word resilience until last year, when I was invited to join the UNISDR's advisory group of parliamentarians on disaster risk reduction. I'm so pleased that Nikki Wagner, MP for Christchurch Central, has now joined the advisory group and taken the baton for the next leg of the marathon relay that will ensure an ongoing connection and dialogue with leaders in other parts of the world that have experienced disaster as we have. We have much to learn from each other. So to resilience, what does it mean? The ability to prepare and plan for, absorb, recover from, or more successfully adapt to actual or potential adverse events. And it is the inclusion of that word adapt that people often forget when they're thinking about what resilience means. Building resilience is about enabling people, communities, and systems to be better prepared to withstand catastrophic events, both natural and man-made. And I want to speak about that for a minute because it isn't just about preparing for the next earthquake. It is actually thinking about catastrophic events that impact on us as a society, as a series of communities, and then think about how we have the ability to absorb, to bounce back or perhaps bounce forward, as I've heard some describe it, and emerge stronger. So this isn't about preparing for the next earthquake, it's about the impact of the global financial crisis, it's about a major drought, it's about sea level rise. All of these things are utterly connected in terms of resilience. So this recovery, as we have all been working to define, is helping to make our building stock and infrastructure stronger, but we are also looking to improve our economy our institutions, and how we work together with the diverse communities that make up the city and the new communities who will come to be part of our recovery. On Saturday, participants made it clear that we are talking not only about communities of locality, but also communities of interest and communities of identity. 
I acknowledge that many of our residents in Christchurch have come to resent the use of the word resilience, as it can appear to minimise their situation, having been worn down with dealing with EQC, insurance companies, community dislocation, dashed expectations and an uncertain future. The earthquakes did not cause equal damage across the city, and some places are doing better than they ever were before, while other areas have been utterly devastated. There is no one, though, who is unaffected, even though they may have escaped the physical damage. And that is the challenge for the council. There are new neighbours. House prices and rents have increased. Traffic congestion is found in residential streets not built as main thoroughfares. And there is car parking in quiet neighbourhoods with the influx of relocated businesses from the CBD. The challenges are huge. It is unfortunate, but inevitable, that to gear up sort out and respond to the tremendous needs post a catastrophic disaster, that mistakes are made, that always happens. And people can be confused about where to turn. There should be no wrong door in a post-disaster environment. People don't care who does it, they just want things fixed. As a new council coming in with the clarity that only hindsight brings, we need to focus on putting our own house in order and partnering with the government to ensure that things get fixed, that things get done, that Christchurch's recovery is fulfilled. Personally, for me, that means achieving a resilient community. We need to build local community capacity because decisions and the ultimate resilience of a community are driven from the bottom up. But at the same time, we need to ensure that communities have access to expert advice and support that they need. For example, the council has to take a leadership role and work with communities that have increased flood risk to contend with, and we will be doing that as part of the district plan review. But recovery on an individual level means more than that. How do you know when you're recovered? I once heard recovery described as when you are living the life you want to live. I think the intention was to show that recovery is personal, and it's more about having the sense that you've regained control full control of your own destiny. So how do we get there? Well, let's start in 2030 and look back. Here's an image that shows the destruction, the transition, and the rebuild, the past, the present, and the future. But let's look at the people. Think of their experience of Christchurch pre-September 2010. Not all of them were born. The very young ones will have no memory of what, was, what went before. They will grow up during the transition. Their normal will include cranes on the skyline, high-vis vests and dump trucks. Their normal will include moving out of their house while it's repaired or rebuilt. The young parents will be my age, and they are still here. They didn't leave. They rebuilt their lives, their businesses, their careers, and raised their families. Some of them will be retiring, in 2030, I will be 70 years old. I think they will be firmly focused on the ones that aren't in the picture yet, their grandchildren. Some will be well and truly retired, and they will always hold the memory of the Christchurch that was, and we will have honoured the memory with careful restoration of our built and natural heritage. Thinking again of the marathon relay, who will be holding the baton in 2030? The children on the left are the 30-somethings who will be running for council for the first time, and the babies will be the teenagers they will want to keep here. The count, this council recognises how critical our leg of the relay will be, not only to position ourselves for a successful rebuild, but that the city these children will inherit in 2030, its people, its neighbourhoods, its businesses and its council are resilient in the full sense of the word. Thank you.